<laughs> All right, let's turn to Book of Acts. Uh, Bill Rudolph is our guest preacher today, and he is talking about what we leave behind from Acts chapter 20. Now, let me give you a, a very quick summary here because we've got to rush today, unfortunately. Uh, just appreciate this that uh, what you're witnessing is is that Paul is getting toward the end of his ministry here, and uh, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He doesn't have time to go to Ephesus, which is not a port city, and so he has called for the elders to meet him there as he's journeying through, and he gives them some what you would call last-minute coaching, last-minute instruction, okay? So he's basically saying to them, listen, pay attention to this, because I'm not going to get a chance to talk to you again, okay? That wasn't in the day when you could Facebook or whatever you do, FaceTime and all the other things that we do where he could just keep talking to them. This was it, basically. He continued to write letters and appreciate that when you read the New Testament, you read like the, the Book of Romans, that was really a, a letter, a series of letters that Paul wrote to the church in Rome, from Rome as well, in one case. And, and so he wrote those letters, and then eventually delegates, emissaries from other churches would come and visit, and they would say, hey, we have a letter that Paul wrote us, instructions. And they would say, I want to make a copy of that. Say so they would get the Xerox machine out, fire it up, and make photocopy, okay? And then they'd take it with them. And then when they went somewhere, somebody would say, hey, fire up the Xerox. I want a photocopy of that, right? And so that's the way it, it went. It just went and went, went. So three key things, as, as Stacy's going to read for us, um, true salvation, true doctrine, true assurance. Stacy, go ahead. From Miles and Paul sent to Ephesus to the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you, from the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, and in the midst of severe testimony by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach to anything, to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. I have declared to the Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying the good news of God's grace. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all your flocks for which the Holy Spirit has made you for you. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought with his own blood. I know that I leave savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flocks. Even from your own number, men will arise from the source of food in order to draw away the sight of the men. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day in tears. And everything I did, I showed that by this kind of hard work, you must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was the statement that he would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. Thank you, Stacy. So when we begin to think about these concepts of true salvation, true doctrine, and true assurance, um, it is good to be reminded as we get toward the new year of these very things. And so I want to just make sure that you appreciate how Paul started this conversation and he uses the concept of humility. And it says, um, I serve the Lord with great humility. And so when we begin to think about humility, it means that it means different things to different people. So I thought, you know, I'm going to go around the room today 
And I'm going to start with Rusty on what the definition of humility is. And I knew that already I would fail. So I'm not going to do that exercise. Yeah. Yeah, don't. Um, So instead, I'll ask the group. I'll ask the group. Help me define humility. Help me define humility. Well, he does do that. Yeah. He does do that. He does. Have you thought that? Oh, yeah, right. Other stories. What's that? Being right sized. Right sized. Oh, go further with that. What does that mean? <laughs> that means to know your place, to, to be humble. Okay. okay. <clears throat> to know your place, to be to be <clears throat> sized right for the situation. Okay. Not to be arrogant. Okay. Not to be arrogant. <laughs> okay. Well, he. <clears throat> So far, Rusty, he's in your, no, none, none The yet. first one does. The first one does. Any others? <laughs> what self right not to be self right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I pick on Rusty a lot, and he deserves it. Right. Right. But I will tell you that he meets a few of these. Yes. yes. Don't know yes. it. Yes. Um, it's it's the facade. Yeah. Look past the facade. <laughs> if you can. Uh, so humility, and and there's plenty of other definitions. I just wanted you to understand that that when Paul writes about the fact that he has great humility, some people would automatically say, "Wait a minute." He pointed out he has great humility. Then he must not have it. Right. The style of writing that Paul is doing is to draw attention to the reality of the situation. So um, I would say to you that if you read Paul uh, with with great um, with with a great filter toward grace, you would understand what he means by this. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, two of those definitions are not. Um, and putting others first still isn't defining what you are. And I think in the case of Paul, <coughs> still that's what's in there, not Paul. Paul's not in there, his word is in there. So he's full. To be able to give to others, and and so you you pulled it all back around, right? And that's that's perfect because uh, that's a great that's a great opportunity to just to segue into verse twenty, right? Where he says, "You know that I'm not hesitate to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from and from house to house." Okay, so preach and teach. Is how we can begin to understand true salvation, true doctrine, true assurance. So I want you to recognize two points out of this that he says. Anything that is helpful. Not everybody hears your words. Sometimes they only see your actions. Right? Um, Saints. St. Francis of Assisi, I believe, originally said it. It's often attributed to John Wesley, but, uh, you know, to preach the word. And if you have to, word, you live the word. So it's about living God's word. And then if you have to, you, you speak about it, right? And so people will see your actions, particularly <coughs> at the stage of ministry that we're in, because we're more in in small group and individual type situations, uh, that's really where uh, your humility will kind of help that, but also that's where you can teach and preach more than you can in just big words, okay? Um, many of you in here just, and it's okay, you aren't interested, you aren't comfortable, you don't feel called to preach in front of the church. Good, <laughs> but we all can preach and teach in any way that's helpful to people. Some people, it is not with words. 
it's with actions. <clears throat> it's by being a model, it's by being an example. And then he also mentions public and private. So I just want you to notice, he said, but I have taught you publicly and from house to house. So you don't always have to teach and preach publicly. Sometimes privately will get you more traction and more action as a result. <laughs> Fair enough? Now, I don't want you to miss that because, um, you know, today, and appropriately so, we, we anointed and, and dedicated Bill Orndahl to go out with his family in, in the full-time ministry. Okay, good. That will be great. You also should have the same thing done to you, and it may not be publicly that you go out. It may be privately. It may be a phone call. It may be a text message. It might be a Facebook posting. It might be a visit. It might be a card. Whatever it is, you can preach and teach on a small, very intimate and personal basis. Do not eliminate that from your thought process. More of that will go further for the average person than it will be for them to think about we're going to get them here so they can hear a sermon, right? That doesn't always happen. So, again, public and private, you, you have to balance out to what God calls you to. Verse 21, um, I, I entitled it, Turn to God, and then I put in parentheses, not anything else, right? Um, so he says in 21, I've declared to both Jews and Greeks, they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So, the reason I want to focus on turn to God is, um, you know, you've heard me say this before, study after study after study says that this time of the year for many people is the loneliest time of the year, okay? And it's lonely for some people even when they're in the midst of a crowd. And, and if you don't know and understand what I'm saying, thank God you don't, right? But there are a lot of people in the world that can be in a holiday party, and they still feel totally alone. Okay? They don't have to be at home with no one calling them, no one visiting them, no one sending them a card, no one texting them. That 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 can be a case, too. That, that one's easy to identify, right? There are a lot of people in the world that are very lonely, even in a crowd. So I want you to appreciate that uh, we need to help people and ourselves turn to God and not to anything else. Don't, don't let other things substitute for that. Now, some things to think about when we turn to God. In, in order to turn to God, we have to be repentant. Okay? Um, you've seen me use this before where uh, repentant means that literally I am changing direction. Okay? To repent means to turn. And it doesn't mean to veer. Veering is only partial. It, it's, it's symbolic of I have to turn completely around and, and move toward God and not away from God. Okay? Even if I'm moving, I think I'm moving parallel to God, you can't. You either are moving toward or you're moving away. There is no in-between with God. Now, here's what I want you to remember. In repentance, it's important that uh, it's not quite the right word, but we would say it often. To be repentant means I'm sorry. Here's the problem with sorry. Sorry is, am I sorry for the action? And I wrote them down for you. Am I sorry for the action that was created? Am I sorry for inaction? Or am I sorry for getting caught? Okay. The, the problem with being sorry that I got caught is it is not a sincere action or a sincere uh, result of my behavior. Okay, I'm sorry I got caught. I'm really sorry. Why are you sorry? And are you sorry because you got caught? Or are you sorry because you did what you did, right? There's a difference there, and I hope you hear it. And for those of you who've had children, you definitely know what I'm talking about. Right? So I want you to appreciate that God looks at us, and he is interested that we are sorry for the right reasons, that we're repenting for the right reasons. Now, there are plenty of people. And, and I administered to some who have grave consequences to the results of their sin. Okay? Um, prison. Uh, disease. Uh, 
divorce, broken relationships, uh, termination from careers. I mean, uh, you, you, you probably think back, you know people that are like it, right? And in some cases, they were sorry because they got caught. And then I have to be the guy when they come to me and say, you know, how come it's not changing? Why are you sorry? Mm-hmm. Are you sorry because you got caught? Or are you sorry because truly you know that you have sinned? And if you're sorry because you have sinned, <clears throat> the consequences may be still get caught. But that's where repentance comes. Is that we are sorry that we have sinned. So we're sorry for our action, right? Or perhaps even our image. And then also in verse 21, you recognize that he's saying this at the very end. He says, and have faith in our Lord Jesus. So we have to have faith in our Lord Jesus, in order for that turning to God to occur, okay? To, for it to stick, for it to last. Now, verse 22, and now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me then. Uh, so how can you be compelled by the Holy Spirit? How do you think the Holy Spirit compels us? And the reason I think this is probably the one of the central focuses of the lesson today is because let, let's go back to some basics real quick. Um, some of you come from a background, particularly if you're Pentecostal background, um, where you you have to speak in tongues. You have to do something really obvious and and measurable in order for people to say, "Oh, you've got God's Holy Spirit." Uh, I want to promise you, though, um, consistently through the New Testament consistently through the 29 books of the New Testament, consistently, uh, the word is directly from Jesus, Paul, Peter, John, they say it multiple times, okay? Uh, the gospel writers repeat Jesus on it, that God's comforter, his His Holy Spirit, uh, his advocate, some of the translations will say, comes into your life, comes into your, we would say in Christian terms, into your heart, right? comes into your soul, into your being, the moment that you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Sometimes we don't feel a change. Sometimes we say to others, well, I know that's promised, but I don't feel that. I want you to appreciate that sometimes um, that is not a mark. That is not a bad grade. Listen to me again. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay? So that, that's a promise. So I want you to understand that that is the receiving of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now, maybe you haven't felt that movement. Maybe you haven't seen the signs of it. Um, I would say that you need to continue to study that and pray that and look for that. But the Holy Spirit compels us in a lot of ways. And here's some things I just want you to be aware of, that how the Holy Spirit kind of works in our lives sometimes. And, and we, we miss that because, again, you read storms, right? I mean, things on Facebook and even in guideposts, or Reader's Digest and all the other things that we see or movies and and, and you see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in somebody's life, and you think, how come I can't have that, right? Well, you may. You just may not be designating or naming it, right? So God's Holy Spirit compels us in a lot of ways. Well, one way is whisper. And, mm-hmm. and uh, when I say a whisper, I mean, it's not an audible voice. Sometimes it's... Uh, <laughs> Bill's here, so he would laugh. You know, you go to these churches when you lay speak. I remember I was at one, and, and there was a gentleman who was 96 years old, and had been a lay speaker for like 60 some years. And he was sitting there, and, and he used the term that the unction of God. Now, think of the old term unction, all right? Um, I heard another minister one time call it the spiritual monkey on your back. You know, it's this feeling. So sometimes, God's Holy Spirit works through a whisper. It's it's so quiet that if you're not sensitive, you miss it. Okay? 
So it or becomes you ignore a, it. Or you ignore <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. You got your fingers stuffing your ears by la 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 la. la. Yeah. 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 Well, that's right. I've done that. You heard it, but you ignored it. The Holy Spirit speaks through prayer time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and it becomes important that you recognize that in your prayer time, how much of it is you picked up the phone, you said, Dear God, or maybe really formal, Heavenly Father, Lord of all, creator of the universe, and you begin to talk. And you talk. I don't know how long. One minute, five minutes, 15 minutes. And then you say amen, you hang up. Okay? <laughs> so if you call me and you do the same thing and say, hey, Doug, and you begin talking and you get done and say, good talking to you and you hang up. And then you go tell people, I spoke to Doug for 15 minutes today and he didn't tell me anything. <laughs> okay. So when you speak in prayer time, it is important, it is important that you spend some quiet time in there. You don't say anything. You're just being quiet in the presence of God, okay? So sometimes a whisper, uh, a prayer time. One thing that, that um, uh, you've heard me say it here, but I say it, and, and I, you're just going to get tired of me saying it. Um, you know, prayer time is usually our voice going to God. Scripture is God's voice coming to us. So if you say to me, I want to hear God's voice, I'm going to say, have you been reading Scripture? Okay? So no, no. God speaks through Scripture. Yes, Owen. How many times have I read Scripture and go back a day or two later and read the same Scripture and get a whole different meaning? 19 times. Right. right. <laughs> was, that, was that the right answer? Right on. Okay, good. <laughs> Yeah, so it's true. Yeah, how many times does that happen? And that's important that you recognize that God's Holy Spirit speaks through Scripture as well. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, the the New Testament said that the Holy Spirit will remind you. You have to put it in there before the Holy Spirit can remind you. Absolutely. Well said. Perfect. In fact, Jesus says. Uh, at the Last Supper, after after Judas has been has been uh, uh, possessed by the devil and has left, now it's only the eleven key disciples left, and Jesus begins to talk to them very intimately. And one of the things he says to them is, "Do not be afraid. If you appear before the public, Holy Spirit will give you the words that you need. Okay, He will remind you of what to say." And so I think you need to appreciate the scripture, like Kathleen said, when you put it in, it'll be reminded to you, okay? So that's how the Holy Spirit compels us. Um, I think you have to appreciate that there is assurance. There is assurance that God's Holy Spirit is in your life when you become a believer, all right? I, I am assured of the love of my family, even when I'm not in their presence. It's a promise. Okay, it's a promise. So I'm assured of that, right? <clears throat> and then um, here's here's one other thing, and I'm sorry, this is kind of important for me, so I'll spend just probably more time than we need to on this. Sometimes we, we think that the Holy Spirit speaks <laughs> through other speakers, and, and I want to be sure that, that you hear this. Um, our God is a God who speaks directly to his people. So if I come to you and say, hey, I've got a word of God for you. God gave me a word for you. Uh, your antenna should go up immediately. Your radar, radar should go up. Um, whatever I tell you should be confirming to you, but not new news. God doesn't speak through other people with new news for us that we can't find elsewhere. Even me, if I come to you, even you, if you come to me, it should be confirming what we are praying about or aware of or feel compelled to do. But if it's brand new news, you need to filter that. You need to look at it carefully. All right. We've gotten into the habit in the modern church where people walk up and say, uh, God's given me a word for you. Okay. And so if, if somebody does that, I'm not suggesting they're wrong. I'm just saying that, look, 
God's Holy Spirit communicates directly to his people. That's the promise. So if God's Holy Spirit's got to go through you to get to me, something's in the way, right? So if it's confirming, then that's a blessing from God. If it's brand new, you need to go back and pray on that. Just don't stamp that one and say, okay, this is a change in my life because, uh, you know, uh, Dwayne Younger came up to me and said, he's got a word for me from God. Okay, I'm going to hear him because I respect him. I'm going to pass that. I'm going to pass that scripture to you, okay? So just appreciate that. And when I come up and say, hey, Dwayne, I've got a word from God, he laughs and he walks off because he knows it is. Right? So, all right. So verse 23, uh, the Spirit reminds us. Here it says, it, right? I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. So the Spirit reminds us of God's plans for us, right? 24, very quickly, um, when we read it, I think this is so powerful. Uh, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Um, just as a point of trivia, it's often thought that Paul was one of the witnesses to the pre-Olympic games when he was traveling, okay, the race. Um, the, the races were really big deals. They had wrestling matches and races in Greece, and they became national heroes. Were forever, if they became a champion, they never had to pay taxes again, which is a really big deal. And so uh, Paul apparently witnessed that because he's always talking about running the race, right? Running the race. He's talking about sports competition. So I just want to remind you that, that um, it is important that you recognize when you hear this from Paul that his life means nothing to him. It only is about God. So where is your, what is your life meaning nothing? Doesn't mean you're not important. It means who is more important? God. God is more important, right? So it doesn't mean that you're worth nothing. It means in comparison to God, we are nothing because he is everything, all right? So now, what's the ultimate goal? What is our ultimate goal? What do you think our ultimate goal here is? Oh, you're lucky. We're not going to play Jeopardy Day because we don't have time. So the first one is to, um, first you have to know what the goal is, okay? First, you have to know the goal. So if in your prayer time and your scripture study, you're not spending time asking God what the direction is in your life, then odds are you're not going to find that, okay? Um, many of you supervise people. And sometimes the, the day begins at work with saying, okay, what's the objective of today, right? Because if you don't review that, two hours later, you look around and you go, oh my gosh, what are they doing, right? So sometimes you begin the day by saying, what is my goal? What is our goal? What is... What is our mutual objective today? Uh, at Winchester Equipment, we taught all of our frontline managers. You pull everybody together. We called it a stand-up meeting. You review the essentials, talked about customer service, talked about safety, and then what's the objective of the day, right? So you have three or four things, and then you move on. It takes sometimes 70 seconds to do that, but it is critical because otherwise, everybody's going in opposite directions. So when you pray, are you asking God? What is my goal? Okay. Secondly, what's our ultimate goal is he uses the term to finish the race. Um, you know, um, 60 pounds ago when I was a cross country runner, um, you know, we, we had some guys who were, they were for, pretty far back and in cross country, the top seven, <clears throat> top five score and six and seven can help do It's called pushers in, in the score sheet. And so they could be important. And sometimes you have to remind the guys who were six and seven, and they knew they were going to be six and seven that day because they always were. You have to remind them your score matters. You have to finish the race. I tell them, you break your ankle, it doesn't matter, crawl. <laughs> because it could win the meet for us, right? It could win the meet. So you have to finish the race. You have to be willing to say to God, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. Okay. 
And then other, finally, that, that comes down to this component. Okay. You can call it anything you want, but you have to complete the task. You may not understand why God is asking you to move forward and to do this or to do that. You may not understand it, but complete the task anyway. Because in God's big plan, it fits, it works, right? All right, so leaders take note, uh, verses 27 through 30. I think this is important. You keep watch. Why? You might write out the side of there. You keep watch. He warns us to keep watch. Why? Because savage wolves come in. Bill alluded to it in, in his sermon today, um, in the 37-minute sermon today. He alluded to it that savage wolves can come in. Okay? So, um, so what you have to remember is, is that sometimes... Uh, particularly as we become an independent church, there will be people who will start their ideas, right? Their thoughts. And 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 that's okay, but is it true doctrine? <clears throat> Bill talked about true doctrine and how important that is. And it says to be shepherds. Why? Um, so think about the concept of a shepherd. And a shepherd in these days literally stayed with the sheep. A shepherd, maybe not the same one, a lot of times the same one, literally stayed with the sheep 24-7. They didn't walk away, right? And you've probably heard the tradition that a lot of times in the wilds, because in, in this part of Palestine or Israel, is a lot of little uh, coolies or draws or little, little valleys and little hollows. And what they would do is they would take the sheep at night and push them into the corner of those. And then the, the, the shepherds would literally sleep in front of them so the sheep couldn't get out and nothing could come and get them, okay? So it's that concept. We, we have to be shepherds because men will distort the truth. Men will come in and try to take those things away. And finally, I know we're rushing here. God is committed to us. His word is his grace. And God's grace, um, there's some things that's really essential for you to grab, okay? Okay. Um, God's word, God's grace, it builds us up. Remember that God always builds up his people, okay? Um, he gives you an inheritance. So we have an inheritance, and you would know it is, is uh, in Romans in particular in chapter 8. It says, you are therefore now heirs, heirs of Christ, okay? So we, we become brothers and sisters to Jesus Christ through our faith. And then finally, um, and Bill mentioned it today, it's important that we recognize that, that anytime we talk about uh, what is God's grace for us, it helps to sanctify us. God's grace helps to sanctify us. Church eternal meaning. To make us holy. Okay. I'm not holy on my own. I am only holy through the eyes of Jesus Christ. Through the blood of the cross is the only way I can reach any kind of righteousness. On my own, I am not. Through him, I am an heir. I am a son or daughter of Jesus Christ. So, what will you leave behind? That's the big question. Now, remember 10 a.m., combined service next Sunday, no Sunday school. The week after that, January 1st, Sunday school at 9, combined service at 10. Let's say a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. What we leave behind is important, Lord, and we are important in your kingdom, both publicly and privately. We are important, Lord, because we are heirs, heirs even of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Have a good day.